Good evening, the news gang is here. Tonight, is the virus moving too easily in Isli or is it an old story in Old Town? We'll examine the partial lockdown and the runaway curve. Also on the show tonight, the mass testing test for the government. Are the numbers adding up? And the isolation and treatment of Jubilee faction rocks the Senate. What has ODM got to do with it? On the memo tonight, Jamila speaks about the wisdom of Abu Nuasi. Yvonne takes a tour of the White House in Machakos. The kicker wonders whether it is a general problem at the City Hall or a general solution. On the punchline, should we just legalize corruption or what? And the angle is oscillating between the fundamental theorem of calculus and just getting grade one pupils to sit down and do their homework. Let's start this show. Ladies and gentlemen, we start with that word again, cessation of movement. And uh, this happened uh, for Isli and um, Old Town in Mombasa. Here's the announcement that came from the CS. There shall be cessation of movement in and out of Isli area of Nairobi with effect from the 6th of May 2020 at 7 p.m. for the next 15 days. There shall be cessation of movement in the area known as Old Town in Mombasa with effect from the 6th of May at 7 p.m. for the next 15 days. What is going on in Old Town Mombasa, for example? We have restrained ourselves from, you know, applying force and doing certain things that we have to do. Jamila, why is Lee, why Old Town? Good questions, Joe. I know there's a, in fact, was a headline in one of the papers that a certain Muslim preacher is the one who could have been uh, the person who spread uh, the virus in Isli. And there's something I'd like to explain about the Somalian culture and, and, the, and the preachers. We actually do invite them into our homes. I've done it several times. Not for 30 minutes, but just a short, brief story. Right? Yes, it's a brief one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got worried when she said she wanted to explain about the no, Somali No, 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 this is a very short one. This is a very short one, very short one. So they come and then they read the Quran in the home and then they leave. Okay, so they sit there, chances are maybe we'll sit with them or not. And uh, we do it regularly, almost every other Thursday or once a month, twice. But it's something very regular uh, that people do. And uh, the, him going to the homes and doing that is actually pretty normal for us. And chances are he would go to very many homes. So that could have been one way for the virus to spread. Number two, um, we saw the, the, the lockdown, the partial lockdown happened yesterday and, and um, of course the, the residents of, of Isili have been complaining about, about it since then. But then comes to mind that how many of those people that we are talking about actually live in Isili. I, I was looking at some statistics today that show about 100,000 people come to Isili almost on a daily basis. Some who live there, others who come there for business or to shop. We have all those shops, we have restaurants, some even just come to pray at the mosques which are in Isili, mm -hmm. which of course now are not open. That's one. And two, we have people like hawkers who come there and sell their wares. We have uh, people who just come to Uzamboga, Mamamboga Pier, they also have their stalls there. And they don't necessarily live in Isili. And this same um, sentiment is also in Old Town. I was speaking to our reporter in Mombasa, Mtalaki, and he was telling me a lot of people who come into Old Town are people who live in Likoni yeah. or Bamburi or Nyali, and they come to work in the restaurant as waiters, or they are coming to the Marikiti there to buy things or even sell their wares, or they even house helps who come to work in the homes and live at the end of the day. So yes, there are about 28,000 people who live in Old Town, but there's a huge majority of people who come and live. Now, for them, what does this mean? There's no income. They can't come into Old Town. They can't come to the shops which are now closed. In fact, the closure of Marikiti has had a huge impact mm -hmm. because I think it's the biggest market in yeah. CBD. Kilam to town, Mombasa, mm -hmm. goes to shop at Marikiti. Yes, I heard today the governor saying they're going to have some mini markets, about three of them, where people can go shop. shop. They have not opened yet. Until then, what will people do? So there are a lot of... Uh, other aspects to look at, including the fact that some of the young men who live in Old Town who are saying, well, Kumchana wana bambanya so they can get something to take home to the wazes, don't have that now. In fact, one of them said, Tasa wantaka tuwe tuibe, do tuweze ku, kujikimu. So there are all these factors to look at. Yes, Isili and Old Town are 
zones that have had huge uh, infections, like Italy only. By today, 77 infections have been reported. So there needs to be some form of control. But for the residents of those places, it's Mateso. But, but it's, it's, it's a tough call, uh, Linus. I mean, you don't want to be in the shoes of the people who have to make these calls yeah. because the truth of the matter is that uh, uh, the cases are, are rising, the numbers are, are, are huge in these places, 77 for, for, for Eastleigh, for, for Eastley, for example, in, 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 in Old Town, uh, almost every time you have huge numbers coming out of Mombasa, 60, 70% of those numbers will be from, from Old Town. But some would say that uh, this was long in coming. I mean, there was uh, the standoff that we have seen, for example, with the issue of testing, we've seen some people, even health officials, ejected basically from from old town so some people would say it's a decision that was a matter of e when rather than if yes and joe there'll be i fear there'll be more surprises the more we improve the testing process the more people are tested the more surprises kenyans may get to see we just hope that there's nothing or nothing worse than Old Town and Eastley would come out. Because remember, when the cases first started occurring, everybody thought, oh, the first case is in Rongai, so Rongai must be looking really, really uh, bad. And then recently it was Kawangware. Now, attention has shifted to uh, Old Town and Eastley simply because we are testing more people. And testing more people means getting results that some which will not be uh, uh, encouraging. I think there are more surprises ahead, but there's also one thing that it says. It also says that um, we haven't changed much in terms of, uh, of behavior. And I just want us to listen to the voices from Ms. Lee uh, before we continue, because they spoke about their experiences there and how they perceive even the measures taking, taken in the aftermath of the test that have been carried out by the Minister of Health. Ikiwa iko ndani ya Old Town COVID ambao ime ime imekuwa imebobea ndani ya Old Town kusema tu kweli eh naweza kusema mimi kwa macho yangu ama sisi watu wakazi wa Old Town tunatujaona. Mimi sina mgonjwa nipima nini? Mambo mimi utaniingiza kidole paka katika ubongo wangu. Wewe nani nikujua hivyo? So whilst the, whilst we welcome the government initiative I think it's knee-jerk. I think it's unfair and I think we need to uh, readjust how we are dealing with this uh, coronavirus pandemic. Because at the moment, it looks like a punishment. So it will be very unfair for these people, unless the government is, you know, making efforts to uh, give them stipends. You see, if this is the general latitude of the population, then every part of this country is awaiting Isli, awaiting Old Town. We're just a test away from that because look at the attitudes here because there's somebody there who said but i have not seen it mm. Mm. because th this is how kenyans uh, generally uh, uh, work they must see mm -hmm. maybe death or some terrible damage for them to believe that um, uh, this is serious but you see covid works exactly the same way as a common flu so it's not something that people will turn up in uh, in stretchers or, 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 or in coffins on, on day one. It's, it, it's a flu. It, it goes on slowly, you don't, you don't notice it. And it's actually worse than the flu because uh, if you go by what uh, the, uh, Dr. Moth was talking about, he said a lot of these numbers are asymptomatic. You can't see the symptoms. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about that attitude than I am about Old Town and uh, Edisley. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like that gentleman, uh, the, the poster child, quite frankly, of this, uh, of this, this attitude, where someone saying like, "Kuningiza yo ukuba na wen nani," like it's it's actually, <laughs> is the kind of thing that is shocking in the sense yeah. that I mean, those people who come to take the test and everything, they they are experts. I mean, that's their job. So when they tell you open your mouth or whatever with your nose, it's um, that's what you need to do. That's what people do. When you go with a headache, they tell you end up meza tembengapi and you don't ask why can't I take two instead of the four. Mm -hmm. That's just what it is. Like right now, this thing is being led by medical expertise because that's what it is. It is a medical problem. But, but Yvonne... And maybe, yeah. Joe, we could use this opportunity as well to demystify the test. 
Yeah. Because considering what the gentleman was talking about, kuingiza kidole mbaka kwa ubongo wangu, mm. it doesn't, we've taken the test and it doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it, yeah, it, it's, it's actually, it's a bit uncomfortable because it's an object going into your nostrils, mm -hmm. but very brief. And, uh, and, and they have to take it back there because the virus uh, has a way of hiding behind the nose mm -hmm. and, and behind uh, your mouth. Basically, yes. that is where they must reach. That is why actually that uh, thing they use for the But the whole thing, very, less than five seconds. Yeah. Yeah, uh, less than 30 seconds. That nasopharyngeal, yeah. whatever they call it, this, the, the one that's yes. used for the sore, which right. is actually long because they need to get to that oh, point, right. but they don't stay there for a year. It's just a, a matter of a few seconds. But Yvonne, this was a, a, an interesting development because you could tell that the, the government kept warning that we'll be forced to take more stringent measures, but of no, worthy of note is the fact that they outlawed movement into and out of but not within, within yeah. which was kind of the compromise like you know you can't lock yeah. people in their houses but let them stay within their neighborhood right and i mean i think essentially what's happening in isli and old town is what's happening on the larger scale in, in nairobi, nairobi in mombasa Kuala, in Kuala, Kilifi, yeah. and mandera um you know there are no easy answers and and the thing about fighting something like this is you are fighting it on the medical front, but you also have to be cognizant that people have to move around, people have to eat, people have to find food, people have to find work. Um, I mean, and even if you take a look at those studies, I mean, I think Asha Mwilu did that story today where they're talking about, you know, four out of five people are talking about the fact that their incomes have been significantly reduced or lost altogether. Um, so it's some compromises. You can leave your house. We haven't gotten to Italy yet uh, during their lockdown where nobody was allowed to leave at all, you know. I mean, unless you were going to the grocery and even then it was one person of your household, it was for an hour or, or that sort of thing. I mean, I think the idea of it is, is tough. And, and I'd like to just reiterate what um, I think uh, Asmali said, um, that, listen, because this is asymptomatic and because we don't know where it is, what is happening in Italy could very well be the case um, in Westlands, mm -hmm. in in Kariobangi, in Korogosho, Moja, in anywhere. Kibra, in anywhere. Runda, in mm. Karen. Um, and, and that is the most interesting thing when you take a look at the numbers. And this is what's expected once you started to do the mass testing. Now we know what is where and we can start to do measures. I mean, if you take a look at April, the month of April, started off at 81 and then finished the month of April at close to 400 cases. 396. Exactly. Yeah. In how many days? Seven days. We've mm. moved from 396 to over 600 cases. Yeah. Um, you know, that still means there is, there is cause for worry. We are not out of the woods yet, not by a long shot. But just on the thing about, uh, you know, all of these measures that are being put in, it's really important that they start to take a look at food rations and how those are being distributed. Those two have got to go hand in hand so that you ensure cooperation. Uh, you are lay fear. So even as you're telling people, we are restricting your movement, but we're also providing you with food and supplies. And again, back to that study that uh, Asha had talked about by the Population Council, I think only 7% of those who were surveyed said they had received any assistance. And this is despite the fact that, you know, there have been measures put in place. So those two, I think if they go hand in hand, will help to alleviate uh, the and, suffering of Kenya. And, and Francis, um, I mean, I, I, the other day when we were talking to Dr. Lukoya, he made something, a, a very interesting statement. He said that, the, the, the experts will give you know the advice they mm -hmm. will give the picture the projections and everything but ultimately it is a political call i mean it's the politicians uh, the people in government who will decide that actually we can go ahead with this decision for example to yeah. shut down an entire neighborhood there are certain neighborhoods if they are told uh, you need to lock down these people in there they will have to think Mm. very hard and ultimately it's a political decision that that someone will will, will have to make how much uh, how difficult is this right now for the people making the decisions because there is a disease on one hand and then there are people who will complain and then there are the real objective issue of hunger for example mm. that Yvonne is talking about there's no com there's no comfort whatsoever mm. comfort in the sense that the affected persons who are the the, the victims, so to say, of the decisions that would be made by the government have no comfort. On the other hand, the government also has no comfort because you have to disadvantage and Some people. somebody mm. somewhere. And of course, it comes with repercussions. I mean, look at what's happening, for example, to Governor Joho. You saw those videos in Old Town. 
people even uh, taunting him, calling him mm. names, some names uh, that you cannot even use. Uh, um, and all those yeah, things. Um, like, yeah, like Akuja Kasirike, and some other things that you can't even put out on there because they don't understand where he's coming from. But on the other hand, he's trying to explain to them that this is not about me, it's about your safety. And so there are extraordinary things that are likely to happen and will come with a lot of discomfort. You see, initially, and it's good to track back where we came from. Initially, we were told, ah, this is a disease of guys who are coming from abroad. And then people were saying, please don't allow guys to come in. And then we were told, ah, we have stopped flights. Now the disease is within us. And then people were saying, ah, this is an Nairobi disease. <coughs> so once the, the, the four counties were closed up, so to say, it now started internally. Now you hear people in Nairobi say, this is a Kawangware, Isili, Old Town issue. Make no mistake, if we were to do mass testing in Kilimani, where we are currently, the numbers would shoot. Yeah. If you were to do this in Pipeline, in Feather, in Tasia, in Kiambu, in Roaka, the numbers will shoot. So mass testing, mass testing, mass testing is where the numbers will, will be, and this is where we are going to find the solutions. But ultimately, it's also a personal responsibility issue because, I mean, look, for example, in Mombasa, we are told five people who yeah. were tested positive ran away mm -hmm. and all from old town yes. together with their, with their, their families, families. families yeah. so and went basically, to other families. basically what those guys did they have taken the disease to the people they have ran to mm. yeah their so hosts yeah. that explains in very simple terms that the numbers will increase in Who's, Mombasa. Which hosts may well have very vulnerable people, perhaps yeah. Yeah. elderly people, perhaps people who have uh, you know, pre-existing conditions that predispose them to the disease. And I think that is one of the things that people forget. The, the government has been talking a lot about this. Dr. Moth has been emphasizing this a lot, that uh, whereas we have more than 70% of our cases are completely asymptomatic, you cannot tell someone mm -hmm. is unwell, mm -hmm. but that doesn't stop these people from actually spreading the virus. And you don't know who the the next person to catch it will actually be. It actually, yeah. Joe, last, last evening, yeah. people ran away from Isili mm -hmm. to South, South B, B and South, South C. C. Yeah. So some of the guys who ran to South B and South C, they don't even know whether they are positive. They could very well be. So basically what they did, they transferred the virus from Isili to South B and South C. So some of the areas that have not recorded any cases will now start recording cases. And there's a very re reasonable explanation from the medical personnel on why some areas are being locked up so that you don't move the virus from those estates and you don't bring the virus into those estates. But it also becomes easier to contain it within, within the areas because right. you know that you're dealing with cases in there. There's no one bringing something else, so there's no one taking, taking anything it out. out. Absolutely. So you can actually assess how bad that thing is, even within the locked up place, mm. so that you actually devise management measures. Yeah, I mean, I think I just wanted to add that, um, so I'm glad that the government is finally obeying the law which is that those who are in quarantine will not be uh, charged. It won't be at their own cost, but the government will be taking up that cost as it should have been from the beginning. Uh, I think also another thing that I've noticed this week is that the government is now trying to walk back some of uh, the mistakes and the statements and the tone in which uh, they had communicated before. So now we're hearing quarantine is not a punishment. This is being done for your own good. Mm -hmm. they, they, um, and they, now we're actually seeing the results of the threats of you know the harsh tones of the scolding where most people are now saying i don't want to uh, go for quarantine one if it's at my own cost and, and i think now is when we're starting to see you know even joho who at some point got really upset and said nye, nye, you know and then now walked it back and said what we're doing is for your own good but i think this right here um you know also just talks about how you're communicating and i do understand the challenge of communicating something that is faceless like we say 75 percent are asymptomatic you're not seeing tragic horrific ghastly deaths that would tell you you know, we have a big problem. And I think more needs to be done, especially at the community level in terms of, you know, just communicating what this is, what we're dealing with. And granted, there are no easy answers. In Italy, they were fighting the lockdown. In the US right now, that's the, one of the biggest battles they have. Mm -hmm. People are opening salons, even against uh, government directive in Georgia. People are being locked up. I get it. But we still do really need to th think about 
One, how we are communicating this, and then two, all the other safety uh, measures. You know, the anthropological studies, you have to actually feel uh, how people are feeling and see how this affects them. And as Ibon, much as it's uh, good you for speak this. about community, Joy, Joy, let me spoke about community and Gashu, you mentioned the five people who were Meenda Mitini with their family. Mm -hmm. uh, it brings to mind uh, the transmission chains that are drawn by the Ministry yeah. of Health. You started showing a peculiar spread of the disease. For instance, I gave an example of how seven people in total accounted for 81 other people who got the disease, the, the virus, including themselves. They're saying the family members and domestic workers are turning mm -hmm. out to be the highest risk. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who seem to be spreading the disease. Because looking at the story that was done by, by Sam Gituku, it shows you someone who got the virus spread it to their daughter, their son, the house health, and maybe the spouse. And then the house help maybe is one who goes and comes back in the evening, went and spread it to someone else, to their child, to their next door neighbor, and in that way it spread to about 81 people. Now, the preventative measures in the public may largely be working. But now we have now the main issue of what's happening in the households, which are more vulnerable. In fact, it brings me to how yesterday we were told by the Ministry of Health that there were two people who died in Mombasa at home. Mm -hmm. mm. I think a 62-year-old, person and another one who was in their 70s. So there were two people who died in the house. And I think today, out of the ones that we are told had passed away, one other one here in Nairobi also had passed away in the house. That tells you how many people who came into close proximity with those people in the house, probably taking care of them, feeding them, changing them, and how now that disease is going to spread. So now we are having now this as, as another worrying trend, where yeah. now the transmission Deaths chains the are community. just now and, within and, and, and close And actually Dr. Members. Moss spoke about it, and he said that the, these people who die, one, the indication is that they have they're heavily infected yes. and mm. therefore they also shed the virus yeah. a bit more than people who probably are you know, not too sick and are probably in hospital and that sort of thing. So then that means that the people who handled them, their caregivers yeah. and that sort of thing, those people are more, more likely than not going to, to, to catch the virus, so to speak, to contract the virus and then they can pass it on to wherever they, they go. In the case of uh, Kawangware, for example, I think it was patient number 189. This yeah. is one person who spread it to five people within the family, and one of them then uh, could directly be traced to seven other people. So mm -hmm. you have uh, uh, about 13 people that could directly be traced to this one person in a small neighborhood in Kawangware. And you can imagine if you replicate that with each mm. of those 13 people who then would have their own networks, it's something that can completely snowball out of control. Linus, I, I wanted us to speak very briefly about uh, this issue that is disturbing a lot of parents, education, because we have a lot of ground to cover today. But we have the uncertainty about sc the school mm -hmm. calendar. And Yvonne was talking about communication. Mm -hmm. I wonder how this one has been. And I want us to listen to mm -hmm. the CS Magoha because um, he, he, was, um, he was speaking um, in at, Parliament. In Parliament, yeah, I think. Before it was, the Education Committee. And, and talking about when schools might reopen, if at all, anytime soon. Nothing stops the government from saying, well, we think now it is safe enough to risk op opening schools. If, on the other hand, the situation becomes completely uh, out of control, then we, have, we shall have to bite the bullet. The children are alive and they are at home. So what? They are at home and they are safe and they are alive. And if it means that they have to stay for a year, so be it. It is not only in Kenya where this is happening. But who knows? We could be in control in two months and we open and go to school. So please don't, don't open a metal pipe and force me to say, give us dates that this is when you are going to open. It is not possible to do so. The government is consulting. We, we will consult you. We will consult everybody else so that everybody takes the risk. The risk is too much for one minister. Yo, a bit worried when, uh, C.S. Mago has spoke of a pipe and held a his nose. A metal pipe. A metal pipe and held his nose. You know, there are certain concerns in uh, Old Town. which uh, for, needs, for a swab, no, yeah, for a, swab. a pipe. Yeah, yes, not, not, not a, yes, but um, he makes very valid uh, points, especially in painting the uncertainty around this whole issue. 
short of making the admission that nobody is an expert in what is going on right now, short of thus declaring that I don't know, Professor Magoha actually captures the accurate position on this COVID situation. It could end in two months. It, it could be here for the next, um, for the rest of the year. Of the, of the year. Spanish flu in 1918, mm. uh, 1918 lasted for two years. It only ended in 1920. Uh, so nobody yeah. knows. Each country will, will, will swim with the tide. It's how the, the, mm. the infections go uh, in that particular country. But it speaks of children in a way that I would like government to talk about adults as well. Because there is a challenge with restrictions. I don't feel restrictions, movement restrictions, are effective. Every week we are reporting escapes, whether uh, today it's five of uh, infected people. We had people who left. Those are just the ones we report. Isn't those it? are just the ones we yeah, report. Yeah. And how did those, uh, there are two of them that ended up in, uh, uh, I think, Baringo. And then the in others Kericho, that ended up in Kericho. In, in, Kericho. in Kericho. Again, look at that because it tells, it says a lot about our movement restrictions. Are they real or cosmetic? You, how, how, are, how are we having those uh, roadblocks violated and so, so frequently? I think, and Yvonne spoke about communication, and, and, and I want to disagree a bit because I think communication has been done. Everybody knows that coronavirus is in Kenya. Everybody knows that coronavirus can kill, but Kenyans are choosing to keep things the same way they, they have been. There have been a lot of movements, and it's very, very tragic to hear of restrictions being imposed on Isli, but the same evening there's so much movement out of uh, the, the, same, the same area. There could be a number of issues that the government need to own up to. One is capacity. And my feeling is the Kenya Police Service could be overwhelmed because they are manning more roadblocks than they've ever manned in peacetime. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, if you lock down a slee, what does that exactly mean? It means more roadblocks, mm -hmm. and not just more roadblocks, but more hours on the road, road, yeah. roadblocks. You see, for the open areas like um, uh, uh, before curfew hours, the movement is, is allowed. But now in an area like Isli, Old Town, you can't move, it's 24 hours. Now, you can't meet in discipline with indecision, which is what is affecting a lot of these uh, measures being taken by the, by the government. Because on the things that are supposed to be tough, they're not being tough. On things they're not supposed to be tough on, they're being mm. very, very hard. I mean, at some point, I thought we were going to change the motor on our coat of arms from Harambe to at your own cost, <laughs> because that became the, the, the motto. Oh, you are in, you are stuck in at Be your own Beijing. Cost. We'll, we'll bring you back at your at own your cost. cost. It's really good that Parliament saved the day by imposing uh, that requirement that at least for quarantine, government must meet um, uh, the, the cost. But the point is, Government needs to direct enforcement to the right places. If, when it comes to movement restrictions, let them be movement restrictions in reality on the ground. Because you look at countries like um, Italy, uh, which have had this, these cases, there's actually no movement in places that they have imposed restrictions on. But I know, of course, there is a challenge. We are not a social welfare state. Mm. We can't feed people. We can't deliver food to their doorsteps. But this is what it means to be a government. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we, need to, we need to take a break. I mean, when we come back, we want to talk a little bit about that education issue. There's online learning and all the stories about school fees. Uh, Linus escaped from the education lockdown and went back to his sleep. But yeah, that is all good. So we talk about education when we come back from the break. Thank you.